Chapter 14 The Buddha The Awakened He whose conquest is not conquered again, into whose conquest no one in this world enters, by what track can you lead him, the awakened, the omniscient, the trackless? He whom no desire with its snares and poisons can lead astray, by what track can you lead him, the awakened, the omniscient, the trackless? Even the gods envy those who are awakened and not forgetful, who are given to meditation, who are wise, and who delight in the repose of retirement from the world. Difficult to obtain is the conception of men, difficult is the life of mortals, difficult is the hearing of the true law, difficult is the birth of the awakened, the attainment of Buddhahood. Not to commit any sin, to do good, and to purify one's mind, that is the teaching of all the awakened. The awakened call patience the highest penance, long-suffering the highest nirvana, for he is not an anchorite who strikes others, he is not an ascetic who insults others. Not to blame, not to strike, to live restrained under the law, to be moderate in eating, to sleep and sit alone, and to dwell on the highest thoughts, this is the teaching of the awakened. There is no satisfying lusts, even by a shower of gold pieces. He who knows that lusts have a short taste and cause pain, he is wise. Even in heavenly pleasures he finds no satisfaction. The disciple who is fully awakened delights only in the destruction of all desires. Men, driven by fear, go to many a refuge, to mountains and forests, to groves and sacred trees. But that is not a safe refuge, that is not the best refuge. A man is not delivered from all pains after having gone to that refuge. He who takes refuge with Buddha, the law, and the church, he who with clear understanding sees the four holy truths, these, pain, the origin of pain, the destruction of pain, and the eightfold holy way that leads to the quieting of pain, that is the safe refuge. That is the best refuge. Having gone to that refuge, a man is delivered from all pain. A supernatural person, a Buddha, is not easily found. He is not born everywhere. Wherever such a sage is born, that race prospers. Happy is the arising of the awakened. Happy is the teaching of the true law. Happy is peace in the church. Happy is the devotion of those who are at peace. He who pays homage to those who deserve homage, whether the awakened or their disciples, those who have overcome the host of evils and crossed the flood of sorrow, he who pays homage to such as have found deliverance and know no fear, his merit can never be measured by anybody. Chapter 15 Happiness Let us live happily, then, free from ailments among the ailing, among men who are ailing, let us dwell free from ailments. Let us live happily, then, free from greed among the greedy. Among men who are greedy, let us dwell free from greed. Let us live happily, then, though we call nothing our own. We shall be like the bright gods feeding on happiness. Victory breeds hatred, for the conquered is unhappy. He who has given up both victory and defeat he, the contented, is happy. There is no fire like passion. There is no losing throw like hatred. There is no pain like this body. There is no happiness higher than rest. Hunger is the worst of diseases, the body the greatest of pains. If one knows this truly, that is nirvana, the highest happiness. Health is the greatest of gifts, contentedness the best riches, Trust is the best of relationships, nirvana the highest happiness. He who has tasted the sweetness of solitude and tranquility is free from fear and free from sin, while he tastes the sweetness of drinking in the law. The sight of the elect is good, to live with them is always happiness. If a man does not see fools, he will be truly happy. He who walks in the company of fools suffers a long way. Company with fools, as with an enemy, is always painful. 
company with the wise is pleasure, like meeting with kinsfolk. Therefore one ought to follow the wise, the intelligent, the learned, the much enduring, the dutiful, the elect. One ought to follow a good and wise man, as the moon follows the path of the stars. Chapter 16 Pleasure He who gives himself to vanity and does not give himself to meditation, forgetting the real aim of life and grasping at pleasure, will in time envy him who has exerted himself in meditation. Let no man ever look for what is pleasant or what is unpleasant. Not to see what is pleasant is pain, and it is pain to see what is unpleasant. Let therefore no man love anything. Loss of the beloved is evil. Those who love nothing and hate nothing have no fetters. From pleasure comes grief, from pleasure comes fear. He who is free from pleasure knows neither grief nor fear. From affection comes grief, from affection comes fear. He who is free from affection knows neither grief nor fear. From lust comes grief, from lust comes fear. He who is free from lust knows neither grief nor fear. From love comes grief, from love comes fear. He who is free from love knows neither grief nor fear. From greed comes grief, from greed comes fear. He who is free from greed knows neither grief nor fear. He who possesses virtue and intelligence, who is just, speaks the truth and does his own business, him the world will hold dear. He in whom a desire for the ineffable, nirvana, has sprung up, who is satisfied in his mind and whose thoughts are not bewildered by love, he is carried upwards by the stream. Kinsmen, friends, and lovers salute a man who has been long away and returned safe from afar. In like manner, his good works receive him who has done good and has gone from this world to the other, as kinsmen receive a friend on his return. Chapter 17 Anger Let a man leave anger. Let him forsake pride. Let him overcome all bondage. No sufferings befall the man who is not attached to name and form, and who calls nothing his own. He who holds back rising anger like a rolling chariot, him I call a real driver. Other people are but holding the reins. Let a man overcome anger by love. Let him overcome evil by good. Let him overcome the greedy by liberality, the liar by truth. Speak the truth. Do not yield to anger. Give if thou art asked for little. By these three steps thou wilt go near the gods. The sages who injure nobody and who always control their body, they will go to the unchangeable place, nirvana, where, if they have gone, they will suffer no more. Those who are ever watchful, who study day and night, and who strive after nirvana, their passions will come to an end. This is an old saying. O Atula, this is not only of today. They blame him who sits silent. They blame him who speaks much. They also blame him who says little. There is no one on earth who is not blamed. There never was, there never will be, nor is there now a man who is always blamed, or a man who is always praised. But he whom those who discriminate praise continually day after day, as without blemish, Wise, rich in knowledge and virtue, who would dare to blame him, like a coin made of gold from the Gambu River? Even the gods praise him. He is praised even by Brahman. Beware of bodily anger and control thy body. Leave the sins of the body, and with thy body practice virtue. Beware of the anger of the tongue, and control thy tongue. Leave the sins of the tongue, and practice virtue with thy tongue. Beware of the anger of the mind, and control thy mind. Leave the sins of the mind, and practice virtue with thy mind. The wise who control their body, who control their tongue, the wise who control their mind, are indeed well controlled. Chapter 18 Impurity 
Thou art now like a sear leaf. The messengers of death, Yama, have come near to thee. Thou standest at the door of thy departure, and thou hast no provision for thy journey. Make thyself an island, work hard, be wise. When thy impurities are blown away, and thou art free from guilt, thou wilt enter into the heavenly world of the elect. Thy life has come to an end, thou art come near to death. There is no resting place for thee on the road, and thou hast no provision for thy journey. Make thyself an island, work hard, be wise. When thy impurities are blown away, and thou art free from guilt, thou wilt not enter again into birth and decay. Let a wise man blow off the impurities of his self, as a smith blows off the impurities of silver one by one, little by little, and from time to time. As the impurity which springs from the iron, when it springs from it, destroys it, thus do a transgressor's own works lead him to the evil path. The taint of prayers is non-repetition, the taint of houses, non-repair. The taint of the body is sloth. The taint of a watchman, thoughtlessness. Bad conduct is the taint of woman. Greediness, the taint of a benefactor. Tainted are all evil ways in this world and in the next. But there is a taint worse than all taints. Ignorance is the greatest taint. O oh, mendicants, throw off that taint and become taintless. Life is easy to live for a man who is without shame, a crow hero, a mischief-maker, an insulting, bold, and wretched fellow. But life is hard to live for a modest man, who always looks for what is pure, who is disinterested, quiet, spotless, and intelligent. He who destroys life, who speaks untruth, who in this world takes what is not given him, who goes to another man's wife, and the man who gives himself to drinking intoxicating liquors, he, even in this world, digs up his own root. O oh man, know this, that the unrestrained are in a bad state. Take care that greediness and vice do not bring thee to grief for a long time. The world gives according to their faith, or according to their pleasure. If a man frets about the food and the drink given to others, he will find no rest either by day or by night. He in whom that feeling is destroyed and taken out with the very root finds rest by day and by night. There is no fire like passion. There is no shark like hatred. There is no snare like folly. There is no torrent like greed. The fault of others is easily perceived, but that of oneself is difficult to perceive. A man winnows his neighbor's faults like chaff, but his own fault he hides, as a cheat hides the bad die from the gambler. If a man looks after the faults of others, and is always inclined to be offended, his own passions will grow, and he is far from the destruction of passions. There is no path through the air. A man is not a samana by outward acts. The world delights in vanity. The Buddhas are free from vanity. There is no path through the air. A man is not a samana by outward acts. No creatures are eternal. But the awakened are never shaken. Chapter 19 The Just A man is not just if he carries a matter by violence. No, he who distinguishes both right and wrong, who is learned and leads others not by violence, but by law and equity, and who is guarded by the law and intelligent, he is called just. A man is not learned because he talks much. He who is patient, free from hatred and fear, he is called learned. A man is not a supporter of the law because he talks much. Even if a man has learnt little, but sees the law bodily, he is a supporter of the law, a man who never neglects the law. A man is not an elder because his head is grey. His age may be ripe, but he is called old in vain. He in whom there is truth, virtue, love, restraint, moderation, he who is free from impurity and is wise, he is called an elder. An envious, greedy, dishonest man does not become respectable by means of much talking only, or by the beauty of his complexion. 
he in whom all this is destroyed and taken out with a very root, when freed from hatred and wise, is called respectable. Not by tonsure does an undisciplined man who speaks falsehood become a samana. Can a man be a samana who is still held captive by desire and greediness? He who always quiets the evil, whether small or large, he is called a samana, a quiet man, because he has quieted all evil. A man who is not a mendicant, bhikshu, simply because he asks others for alms, he who adopts the whole law is a bhikshu, not he who only begs. He who is above good and evil, who is chaste, who with knowledge passes through the world, he indeed is called a bhikshu. A man is not a muni because he observes silence, if he is foolish and ignorant, but the wise who, taking the balance, chooses the good and avoids evil, he is a muni, and is a muni thereby. He who in this world weighs both sides is called a muni. A man is not an elect because he injures living creatures, because he has pity on all living creatures, therefore is a man called an elect. Not only by discipline and vows, not only by much learning, not by entering into a trance, not by sleeping alone, do I earn the happiness of release which no worldling can know. Bhikshu, be not confident as long as thou hast not attained the extinction of desires. Chapter 20 The Way The best of ways is the eightfold, the best of truths the four words, the best of virtues, passionlessness. The best of men, he who has eyes to see. This is the way. There is no other that leads to the purifying of intelligence. Go on this way. Everything else is the deceit of Mara. If you go on this way, you will make an end of pain. The way was preached by me when I had understood the removal of the thorns in the flesh. You yourself must make an effort. The Buddhas are only preachers. The thoughtful who enter the way are freed from the bondage of Mara. All created things perish. He who knows and sees this becomes passive in pain. This is the way to purity. All created things are grief and pain. He who knows and sees this becomes passive in pain. This is the way that leads to purity. All forms are unreal. He who knows and sees this becomes passive in pain. This is the way that leads to purity. He who does not rouse himself when it is time to rise, who, though young and strong, is full of sloth, whose will and thought are weak, that lazy and idle man will never find the way to knowledge. Watching his speech, well restrained in mind, let a man never commit any wrong with his body. Let a man but keep these three roads of action clear and he will achieve the way which is taught by the wise. Through zeal knowledge is gotten. Through lack of zeal knowledge is lost. Let a man who knows this double path of gain and loss thus place himself that knowledge may grow. Cut down the whole forest of lust, not a tree only. Danger comes out of the forest of lust. When you have cut down both the forest of lust and its undergrowth, then bhikshus, you will be rid of the forest and free. So long as the love of man towards women, even the smallest, is not destroyed, so long as his mind in bondage, as the calf that drinks milk is to its mother, cut out the love of self, like an autumn lotus, with thy hand. Cherish the road of peace. Nirvana has been shown by Buddha. Here I shall dwell in the rain, here in winter and summer, Thus the fool meditates and does not think of his death. Death comes and carries off that man praised for his children and flocks, his mind distracted, as a flood carries off a sleeping village. Sons are no help, nor father, nor relations. There is no help from kinsfolk for one whom death has seized. A wise and good man who knows the meaning of this should quickly clear the way that leads to nirvana. Chapter 21 Miscellaneous If by leaving a small pleasure one sees a great pleasure, let a wise man leave the small pleasure and look to the great. 
He who by causing pain to others wishes to obtain pleasure for himself, he entangled in the bonds of hatred will never be free from hatred. What ought to be done is neglected. What ought not to be done is done. The desires of unruly, thoughtless people are always increasing. But they whose whole watchfulness is always directed to their body, who do not follow what ought not to be done, and who steadfastly do what ought to be done, the desires of such watchful and wise people will come to an end. A true Brahmana goes scatheless, though he have killed father and mother and two valiant kings, though he has destroyed a kingdom with all its subjects. A true Brahmana goes scatheless, though he have killed father and mother and two holy kings and an eminent man besides. The disciples of Gautama are always well awake, and their thoughts day and night are always set on Buddha. The disciples of Gautama are always well awake, and their thoughts day and night are always set on the law. The disciples of Gautama are always well awake, and their thoughts day and night are always set on the church. The disciples of Gautama are always well awake, and their thoughts day and night are always set on their body. The disciples of Gautama are always well awake, and their mind day and night always delights in compassion. The disciples of Gautama are always well awake, and their mind day and night always delights in meditation. It is hard to leave the world to become a friar. It is hard to enjoy the world. Hard is a monastery. Painful are the houses. Painful it is to dwell with equals, to share everything in common, and the itinerant mendicant is beset with pain. Therefore, let no man be an itinerant mendicant, and he will not be beset with pain. Whatever place a faithful, virtuous, celebrated and wealthy man chooses, there he is respected. Good people shine from afar, like the snowy mountains. Bad people are not seen, like arrows shot by night. He alone who, without ceasing, practices the duty of sitting alone and sleeping alone, he, subduing himself, will rejoice in the destruction of all desires alone, as if living in a forest. Chapter 22 The Downward Course He who says what is not goes to hell. He also who, having done a thing, says I have not done it. After death both are equal. They are men with evil deeds in the next world. Many men whose shoulders are covered with the yellow gown are ill-conditioned and unrestrained. Such evildoers by their evil deeds go to hell. Better it would be to swallow a heated iron ball like flaring fire than that a bad unrestrained fellow should live on the charity of the land. Four things does a reckless man gain who covets his neighbor's wife. A bad reputation, an uncomfortable bed, thirdly, punishment, and lastly, hell. There is bad reputation and the evil way to hell. There is the short pleasure of the frightened in the arms of the frightened and the king imposes heavy punishment. Therefore, let no man think of his neighbor's wife. As a grass blade, if badly grasped, cuts the arm, badly practiced asceticism leads to hell. An act carelessly performed, a broken vow, and hesitating obedience to discipline, all this brings no great reward. If anything is to be done, let a man do it. Let him attack it vigorously. A careless pilgrim only scatters the dust of his passions more widely. An evil deed is better left undone, for a man repents of it afterwards. A good deed is better done, for having done it, one does not repent. Like a well-guarded frontier fort, with defenses within and without, so let a man guard himself. Not a moment should escape, for they who allow the right moment to pass suffer pain when they are in hell. They who are ashamed of what they ought not to be ashamed of, and are not ashamed of what they ought to be ashamed of, such men, embracing false doctrines, enter the evil path. They who fear when they ought not to fear, and fear not when they ought to fear, 
Such men, embracing false doctrines, enter the evil path. They who forbid when there is nothing to be forbidden, and forbid not when there is something to be forbidden, such men, embracing false doctrines, enter the evil path. They who know what is forbidden as forbidden, and what is not forbidden as not forbidden, such men embracing the true doctrine, enter the good path. Chapter 23 The Elephant Silently shall I endure abuse, as the elephant in battle endures the arrow sent from the bow, for the world is ill-natured. They lead a tamed elephant to battle. The king mounts a tamed elephant. The tamed is best among men, he who silently endures abuse. Mules are good if tamed, and noble Sindhu horses, and elephants with large tusks, but he who tames himself is better still. For with these animals does no man reach the untrodden country, Nirvana, where a tamed man goes on a tamed animal, viz. on his own well-tamed self. The elephant, called Dhanapalaka, his temples running with sap and difficult to hold, does not eat a morsel when bound. The elephant longs for the elephant grove. If a man becomes fat and a great eater, if he is sleepy and rolls himself about, that fool, like a hog fed on wash, is born again and again. This mind of mine went formerly wandering about as it liked, as it listed, as it pleased, but I shall now hold it in thoroughly, as the rider who holds the hook holds in the furious elephant. Be not thoughtless. Watch your thoughts. Draw yourself out of the evil way, like an elephant sunk in mud. If a man find a prudent companion who walks with him, is wise and lives soberly, he may walk with him, overcoming all dangers, happy but considerate. If a man find no prudent companion who walks with him, is wise and lives soberly, let him walk alone, like a king who has left his conquered country behind, like an elephant in the forest. It is better to live alone. There is no companionship with a fool. Let a man walk alone. Let him commit no sin, with few wishes, like an elephant in the forest. If an occasion arises, friends are pleasant. Enjoyment is pleasant. Whatever be the cause, a good work is pleasant in the hour of death. The giving up of all grief is pleasant. Pleasant in the world is the state of a mother, pleasant the state of a father, pleasant the state of a samana, pleasant the state of a brahmana. Pleasant is virtue lasting to old age, pleasant is a faith firmly rooted, pleasant is attainment of intelligence, pleasant is avoiding of sins. Chapter 24 Thirst The thirst of a thoughtless man grows like a creeper. He runs from life to life, like a monkey seeking fruit in the forest. Whomsoever this fierce thirst overcomes, full of poison, in this world his sufferings increase like the abounding barana grass. He who overcomes this fierce thirst, difficult to be conquered in this world, sufferings fall from him like water drops from a lotus leaf. This salutary word, I tell you, do ye, as many as are here assembled, dig up the root of thirst, as he who wants the sweet-scented Uzziah root must dig up the Burana grass, that Mara may not crush you again and again, as the stream crushes the reeds. As a tree, even though it has been cut down, is firm so long as its root is safe and grows again, thus, unless the feeders of thirst are destroyed, the pain of life will return again and again. He whose thirst running towards pleasure is exceeding strong in the thirty-six channels. The waves will carry away that misguided man, viz. his desires which are set on passion. The channels run everywhere. The creeper of passion stands sprouting. If you see the creeper springing up, cut its root by means of knowledge. A creature's pleasures are extravagant and luxurious. Sunk in lust and looking for pleasure, men undergo again and again birth and decay. Men, driven on by thirst, run about like a snared hare. 
held in fetters and bonds, they undergo pain for a long time again and again. Men driven on by thirst run about like a snared hare. Let, therefore, the mendicant drive out thirst by striving after passionlessness for himself. He who, having got rid of the forest of lust, after having reached nirvana, gives himself over to forest life, to lust, and who, when removed from the forest, runs to the forest, look at that man, though free, he runs into bondage. Wise people do not call that a strong fetter which is made of iron, wood, or hemp. Far stronger is the care for precious stones and rings, for sons and a wife. That fetter wise people call strong which drags down, yields, but is difficult to undo. After having cut this at last, people leave the world free from cares and leaving desires and pleasures behind. Those who are slaves to passions run down with the stream of desires, as a spider runs down the web which he has made himself. When they have cut this at last, wise people leave the world free from cares, leaving all affection behind. Give up what is before, give up what is behind, give up what is in the middle when thou goest to the other shore of existence. If thy mind is altogether free, thou wilt not again enter into birth and decay. If a man is tossed about by doubts, full of strong passions, and yearning only for what is delightful, his thirst will grow more and more, and he will indeed make his fetters strong. If a man delights in quieting doubts, and always reflecting dwells on what is not delightful, the impurity of the body, he certainly will remove, nay, he will cut the fetter of Mara. He who has reached the consummation, who does not tremble, who is without thirst and without sin, he has broken all the thorns of life. This will be his last body. He who is without thirst and without affection, who understands the words and their interpretation, who knows the order of letters, those which are before and which are after, he has received his last body. He is called the great sage, the great man. I have conquered all. I know all. In all conditions of life I am free from taint. I have left all, and through the destruction of thirst I am free, having learnt myself. Whom shall I teach? The gift of the law exceeds all gifts. The sweetness of the law exceeds all sweetness. The delight in the law exceeds all delights. The extinction of thirst overcomes all pain. Pleasures destroy the foolish. If they look not for the other shore, the foolish by his thirst for pleasures destroys himself, as if he were his own enemy. The fields are damaged by weeds. Mankind is damaged by passion. Therefore, a gift bestowed on the passionless brings great reward. The fields are damaged by weeds. Mankind is damaged by hatred. Therefore, a gift bestowed on those who do not hate brings great reward. The fields are damaged by weeds. Mankind is damaged by vanity. Therefore, a gift bestowed on those who are free from vanity brings great reward. The fields are damaged by weeds. Mankind is damaged by lust. Therefore, a gift bestowed on those who are free from lust brings great reward. Chapter 25 The Bhikshu Mendicant Restraint in the eye is good. Good is restraint in the ear. In the nose restraint is good. Good is restraint in the tongue. In the body restraint is good. Good is restraint in speech. In thought restraint is good. Good is restraint in all things. A bhikshu restrained in all things is freed from all pain. He who controls his hand, he who controls his feet, he who controls his speech, he who is well controlled, he who delights inwardly, who is collected, who is solitary and content, him they call bhikshu. 
The bhikshu who controls his mouth, who speaks wisely and calmly, who teaches the meaning and the law, his word is sweet. He who dwells in the law, delights in the law, meditates on the law, follows the law, that bhikshu will never fall away from the true law. Let him not despise what he has received, nor ever envy others. A mendicant who envies others does not obtain peace of mind. A bhikshu who, though he receives little, does not despise what he has received. Even the gods will praise him if his life is pure and if he is not slothful. He who never identifies himself with name and form and does not grieve over what is no more, he indeed is called a bhikshu. The bhikshu who acts with kindness, who is calm in the doctrine of Buddha, will reach the quiet place, nirvana, cessation of natural desires, and happiness. O bhikshu, empty this boat. If emptied, it will go quickly. Having cut off passion and hatred, thou wilt go to nirvana. Cut off the five senses. Leave the five. Rise above the five. A bhikshu who has escaped from the five fetters, he is called Ogatina, saved from the flood. Meditate, O bhikshu, and be not heedless. Do not direct thy thought to what gives pleasure, that thou mayest not for thy heedlessness have to swallow the iron ball in hell, and that thou mayest not cry out when burning, This is pain. Without knowledge there is no meditation. Without meditation there is no knowledge. He who has knowledge and meditation is near unto nirvana. A bhikshu who has entered his empty house and whose mind is tranquil feels a more than human delight when he sees the law clearly. As soon as he has considered the origin and destruction of the elements of the body, he finds happiness and joy which belong to those who know the immortal, nirvana. And this is the beginning here for a wise bhikshu, watchfulness over the senses, contentedness, restraint under the law, keeping noble friends whose life is pure and who are not slothful. Let him live in charity. Let him be perfect in his duties. Then, in the fullness of delight, he will make an end of suffering. As the Vasika plant sheds its withered flowers, men should shed passion and hatred. O oh, ye bhikshus! The bhikshu whose body and tongue and mind are quieted, who is collected and has rejected the baits of the world, he is called quiet. Rouse thyself by thyself. Examine thyself by thyself. Thus self-protected and attentive wilt thou live happily, O bhikshu. For self is the lord of self. Self is the refuge of self. Therefore curb thyself as the merchant curbs a good horse. The bhikshu, full of delight, who is calm in the doctrine of the Buddha, will reach the quiet place, nirvana, cessation of natural desires and happiness. He, who even as a young bhikshu applies himself to the doctrine of Buddha, brightens up this world like the moon when free from clouds. Chapter 26 The Brahmana Stop the stream valiantly. Drive away the desires, O Brahmana. When you have understood the destruction of all that was made, you will understand that which was not made. If the Brahmana has reached the other shore in both laws, in restraint and contemplation, all bonds vanish from him who has obtained knowledge. He for whom there is neither this nor that shore, nor both, him, the fearless and unshackled, I call indeed Brahmana. He who is thoughtful, blameless, settled, dutiful, without passions, and who has attained the highest end, him I call indeed a Brahmana. The sun is bright by day, the moon shines by night, the warrior is bright in his armor, the Brahmana is bright in his meditation, but Buddha, the awakened, is bright with splendor day and night. Because a man is rid of evil, therefore he is called Brahmana. Because he walks quietly, therefore he is called Samana. Because he has sent away his own impurities, therefore he is called a pilgrim. No one should attack a Brahmana, 
but no Brahmana, if attacked, should let himself fly at his aggressor. Woe to him who strikes a Brahmana! More woe to him who flies at his aggressor! It advantages a Brahmana not a little if he holds his mind back from the pleasures of life. When all wish to injure has vanished, pain will cease. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who does not offend by body, word, or thought, and is controlled on these three points. After a man has once understood the law as taught by the well-awakened Buddha, let him worship it carefully, as the Brahmana worships the sacrificial fire. A man does not become a Brahmana by his plaited hair, by his family, or by birth. In whom there is truth and righteousness, he is blessed. He is a Brahmana. What is the use of plaited hair, O fool? What are the raiment of goatskins? Within thee there is ravening, but the outside thou makest clean. The man who wears dirty raiments, who is emaciated and covered with veins, who lives alone in the forest and meditates, him I call indeed a Brahmana. I do not call a man a Brahmana because of his origin or of his mother. He is indeed arrogant and he is wealthy. But the poor, who is free from all attachments, him I call indeed a Brahmana. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who has cut all fetters, who never trembles, is independent and unshackled. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who has cut the strap and the thong, the chain with all that pertains to it, who has burst the bar and is awakened. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, who, though he has committed no offense, endures reproach, bonds and stripes, who has endurance for his force and strength for his army. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, who is free from anger, dutiful, virtuous without appetite, who is subdued and has received his last body. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who does not cling to pleasures like water on a lotus leaf, like a mustard seed on the point of a needle. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who even here knows the end of his suffering, has put down his burden, and is unshackled. Him I call indeed a Brahmana whose knowledge is deep, who possesses wisdom, who knows the right way and the wrong, and has attained the highest end. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who keeps aloof both from laymen and from mendicants, who frequents no houses and has but few desires. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who finds no fault with other beings, whether feeble or strong, and does not kill nor cause slaughter. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who is tolerant with the intolerant, mild with fault-finders, and free from passion among the passionate. Him I call indeed a Brahmana from whom anger and hatred pride and envy have dropped like a mustard seed from the point of a needle. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who utters true speech, instructive and free from harshness, so that he offend no one. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who takes nothing in the world that is not given him, be it long or short, small or large, good or bad. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who fosters no desires for this world or the next, has no inclinations, who fosters no desires for this world or for the next, has no inclinations, and is unshackled. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who has no interests, and when he has understood the truth, does not say, How? How? And who has reached the depth of the immortal. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who in this world is above good and evil, above the bondage of both, free from grief from sin and from impurity. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who is bright like the moon, pure, serene, undisturbed, and in whom all gaiety is extinct. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who has traversed this miry road, the impassable world and its vanity, who has gone through and reached the other shore, is thoughtful, guileless, free from doubts, free from attachment, and content. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, who in this world, leaving all desires, travels about without a home, and in whom all concupiscence is extinct. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, who leaving all longings, travels about without a home, and in whom all covetousness is extinct. 
Him I call indeed a Brahmana, who after leaving all bondage to men, has risen above all bondage to the gods, and is free from all and every bondage. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, who has left what gives pleasure and what gives pain, who is cold and free from all germs of renewed life, the hero who has conquered all the worlds. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, who knows the destruction and the return of beings everywhere, who is free from bondage, welfaring, and awakened. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, whose path the gods do not know, nor spirits, Gandavas, nor men, whose passions are extinct, and who is a venerable. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who calls nothing his own, whether it be before, behind, or between, who is poor and free from the love of the world. Him I call indeed a Brahmana, the manly, the noble, the hero, the great sage, the conqueror, the impassable, the accomplished, the awakened. Him I call indeed a Brahmana who knows his former abodes, who sees heaven and hell, has reached the end of births, is perfect in knowledge, a sage, and whose perfections are all perfect.